May 20th, 1506. Only two years after his fourth and final voyage to the New World, Christopher Columbus, the famous explorer, is dying. Why he is dying is not known. His son and biographer Hernan would later say it was gout that took the life of his father. Still others ascribe the cause to something more sinister. They say he may have been poisoned to death by his enemies. But the cause of their father's death doesn't concern the Columbus sons right now. It's the who they are after. Who is this man they call father? Father, we must know who we are. Could you leave us without telling us your name, our name, father? You can't take all your secrets. Tell us now, we beg you. No, my sons, let him be in peace. Yes, that's right. At the hour of Columbus's death, his sons Diego and Hernan know practically nothing about him. Not even if his true name is Christopher Columbus. They had heard rumors that he was not from Italy, that his mother was Jewish, that he was the bastard child of a member of Portuguese royalty, that he was acting as a secret agent for the King of Portugal against his loyal benefactor, Queen Isabel. They had heard these rumors many times, but when they sought the truth from their father, he would not answer. His life was a secret from his sons, from the world, forever. But maybe not forever. And so the legend of Christopher Columbus was created, a boy born to a poor family of wool dyers in Genoa, who hung out at the docks studying ships and map making. Somehow he learned navigational skills and decided that India could be reached by sailing west across the Atlantic Ocean. Despite his low status, he somehow managed to gain access to the royalty of Europe free to wander the palaces of kings and queens. He spent a lot of time with royalty, entertaining them with the idea of an expedition to discover a new and faster route to India. He was a complete unknown to Queen Isabel of Spain, yet he convinced her to provide a large sum of money to search for this mythical route to riches. And what he discovered was not India at all but a land that came to be known as America, or so goes the story as written by the doubting Washington Irving. But now, there's a team of 21st century researchers who don't believe the story either. They are Americans Dave Horner and Paul Perry, with Portugal's Carlos Evaristo, veteran explorers and historical researchers members of Raja, the Royal Archaeological and Historical Association of Portugal. Horner is a veteran explorer and author, finding a bounty of treasure on Spanish galleons and searching for the remains of Amelia Earhart. Perry is a best-selling book author whose historical explorations include following the fabled trail of Jesus in Egypt and joining the expedition that found Captain Kidd's sunken ship in Madagascar. 
and Evaristo, one of Portugal's most knowledgeable historians, is an archaeologist who is considered by the Vatican to be one of the world's foremost experts in holy relics. Together, these researchers will pursue an alternative story to Columbus that ties together many of the loose ends that have long been unexplained. But first, they want to talk to members of the royalty and nobility, all close to the Columbus story. By talking to them, they will decide whether their well-researched assumptions are right or wrong. They receive responses that they didn't really expect. I believe that everything we know about uh, Columbus is wrong. What in the world do you mean by that? Basically, we, I have all the reasons to believe that he was born a Portuguese, that his father was a Portuguese prince from the royal family, that his mother was a Portuguese from, but from a Jewish ascendancy family, and that he worked as a secret agent for the King of Portugal. Similar information comes from the Duke of Veragua, Christopher Columbus XX. Descendant of the great explorer and an admiral himself, Columbus has commentary about the birthplace of his forefather that lends doubt to the traditional historic story. Aquí sí que es curioso, uh, precisamente el, el, la familia genovesa con la que se identifica Cristóbal Colón, que es una familia de un tejedor de paños de, llamado um, Domenico Colombo, que está casado con, uh, con una eh, mujer llamada eh, Susana Fontana Rosa, que esa es la tesis tradicional. Ahí, eh, precisamente en ese punto de que fuera una familia humilde, um, es eh, un, un punto que atacan todos uh, o muchos de, de los investigadores que sustentan una tesis contraria, porque está en contra de una afirmación que hace Hernando Colón, su hijo, diciendo que ellos eran de una familia noble venida a menos por los tiempos de las guerras y por otras cuestiones. And then there's Count Vasco de Gama, the 19th, an antique dealer in Lisbon, whose Portuguese forefather, a contemporary of Columbus, discovered the ocean route to India. His studies of Columbus leave him little doubt that Columbus was born in Portugal. Why? Because Portuguese tradition says that he was from Portuguese descent and learned his navigational skills at the nautical school of Prince Henry the Navigator. Para mim nasceu em Portugal, seguramente. Sem Cuba, se, sem Alcáceres, não sei. Mas nasceu em Portugal, era português, era de famílias portuguesas. E só assim é que podia estar por dentro de parte das coisas que o Infante Dom Henrique iniciou e, e, e provavelmente fez parte de várias das expedições e, portanto, tinha noção de que havia terra para o oeste. The explorers also spoke to historians and scientists, including the late Captain Augusto Barreto, whose 40 years of investigation uncovered secret documents and maps linking Columbus to a Portuguese prince and a secret mission for King John II of Portugal. And then there is the Raja team's scientific collaborator, Dr. Jose Lorente Acosta, Dean of Forensic Studies at the University of Granada and a former member of the FBI. He has positively identified the bones of Christopher Columbus in his Seville Cathedral tomb and may confirm their theories with further DNA studies. This has not been yet tested, but uh, it will be tested. We are uh, waiting to have the new uh, uh, new technologies that uh, would possibilitate would facilitate this kind of analysis and DNA if we have if we can get enough quantity and quality it would give us a lot of information about the origins of Columbus including direct comparisons with, with some of some of these theories so what is the truth about the man we know as Christopher Columbus the three researchers meet at historic Orem Castle the international headquarters of Raja in Portugal to form the questions that will be the focus of their historical pursuit. The trio decide to gather at the medieval banquet hall where Evaristo has laid out a number of artifacts connected to the Columbus Mysteries. These are uh, artifacts connected to the major mysteries on Columbus that we're trying to confirm or, or debug. 
Was Christopher Columbus truly Italian, or was he the illegitimate son of a Portuguese prince? Was Columbus Jewish? Absolutely, say many historians, including Simon Wiesenthal, Israel's noted Nazi hunter. Was he a secret agent for King John II of Portugal? And if so, why did he go to sea for the Spanish? You wouldn't be allowed to do that unless he was a, a Templar himself or operating in the name of the Portuguese king. The modern day explorers plan to visit Columbus's European world. And many of the places they visit will be ones not found in the history books. But first they go to Sintra, Portugal, where Dom Duarte, Duke of Braganza, head of the Portuguese royal house and Raja's royal patron, wants to share more about Columbus's history, including some family traditions. Everything points to the fact that first he was not an Italian. He never wrote anything in Italian. Then the symbols he used to sign, the symbols who would mean that his original name was Zarco. So the idea is that he was the daughter, the son of a Zarco lady and the daughter of Gonçalo Zarco. And um, he was probably the father was the infant, the prince uh, Don Fernando of Portugal, who was the son of uh, Don Duarte. So basically, the data we have points to that he should be, he was Portuguese and the son of a Portuguese prince and a woman who, who was, he was not married with her uh, so that he didn't want to be classified as being a bastard. It's supposed that he was born in a village called Cuba in Alentejo. The first main island he found, he named it Cuba. Because he had many connections to Jewish culture. He was interested in, in the Jewish uh, tradition. So it could, probably could be the, the son of a Jewish mother. Maybe the Zarco family was uh, Jewish. Well, after his first official trip to where the official discovery of America, when he came back, what he did was not to go to Sevilla, he went to Lisbon. And he stopped here, and he went to see the king, who was upriver in a little town, upriver, because there was a plague in Lisbon at the time. And he stayed for, I think, three days with the king, telling his trip. And after that, he went then to, to Sevilla, to Spain. So that it's very clear what, why he would make a report to the king of Portugal before going to the kings who paid his trip. History is such an interesting uh, science that we should not be offended and we should not uh, take it politically. I know the Italian-Americans are very upset if he's not Italian, but and the Spanish are not very happy uh, that he is Portuguese. But I think we have to address history as a science, and it's more useful to know the truth than to cultivate some historical legends or lies that uh, help us, make us confused, and make history difficult to understand. Their conversation with His Royal Highness genuinely challenged history. Not only did he tell them several things that are not included in standard history books, he forcefully insisted they were 100% factual. These researchers will plow through every aspect of Columbus's life in an effort to solve these 500-year-old mysteries. And in doing that, they plan to bring in a feast of fresh information that will open these cases wide. 
Their goal is a difficult one, to reveal the true Christopher Columbus, something he wouldn't do even on his deathbed. Many archives and libraries of Spain have special connection to Christopher Columbus, which is why our explorers are in the Archive of the Indies in Seville. This is the General Archive of the Indies, is that right? Yes, I was here 25 years ago. Magnificent. And this is the place where they have all the records on Columbus. All, all of the colonial records. And all of, his, all of Columbus's writings, yeah. his letters, all and of his the logs. All the records of the galleons that sailed to and from the New World. Everything's right? here. A key. In 1826, the great American author Washington Irving was given the task to write a biography of Columbus for the U.S. Consulate in Spain. Irving was granted free access to this and other archives, yet despite the wealth of information that made up a meaty two-volume biography, Irving found nothing to indicate that Christopher Columbus had been born in Genoa, Italy. This lack of proof of Columbus's nationality haunts the Irving bio and closed the contemporary case to have Columbus declared a saint by the Pope. On the book's very first page, Irving declares that Columbus was born in Genoa in about 1435. He follows that with a footnote. Readers will find the vexed question about the age, birthplace, and lineage of Columbus severally discussed in the appendix. And so it was, discussed in detail. There has been much controversy about the birthplace of Columbus. It has formed a point of zealous controversy, which is not yet satisfactorily settled. Indeed, Irving presents numerous claims from noblemen, mayors, and ordinary people declaring that Columbus hailed from countries and regions other than Genoa, where most are led to believe he was born. Some of these claims in Irving's books declare him to be a member of noble families. Others claim that his working-class father was, in truth, a fallen member of royalty. Perhaps he didn't research his doubts enough. Irving's biography became an international bestseller, and soon statues and images sprang up all over Europe, many of them announcing Columbus as a proud son of Genoa. But more serious doubt about his birthplace sprang up in the 20th century when Patrocinio Rubiero and Captain Mascarenas Barreto, two Portuguese historians, declared that Christopher Columbus was not only Portuguese, but was the son of the Duke of Beja, and therefore cousin of King John II. Immensas viagens, nunca a Itália, como disseram os italianos, nunca lá foi, mas viajou também pelo Mediterrâneo e por outros lados. And by the way, Columbus couldn't even speak Italian, said Barreto. Sabia italiano, não podia escrever. Há um poema em italiano que ele escreveu, mas ele não escreveu o poema, copiou. É a única coisa que aparece italiano dele. Copiou um poema italiano, pequenino. Um poema pequenino, mais nada. Ele falava realmente português e espanhol muito bem. Eram as duas línguas que ele tinha. The results of Beretta's findings were groundbreaking. He presented his findings all over Europe beginning in 1978. But still, the belief that Columbus was born in Genoa had been solidified. But thanks to DNA, that belief may eventually change. The city hall of Granada, Spain looks more like an art gallery than the seat of local government. There are famous paintings, beautiful paintings, and the official shield of Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand from the 15th century. But the thrill of the history they are seeing is about to be added to by the information Dr. Lorente is going to reveal. Through the hard science of DNA examination, this former FBI agent and current head of the CSI department at Granada University has strong doubts that Christopher Columbus was Italian. Lorente gained access to the DNA of Columbus as part of an international group asked to prove that the Admiral was really buried 
in the famous tomb in Seville Cathedral. With DNA in hand, the group decided to see if Columbus was indeed Italian. They did it by comparing the famous DNA with possible Columbus descendants. The result has not changed history yet. If you say that he's from Italy, you, and you want to prove that he's from Italy, you need to have DNA from some relative of Columbus, either from that time or from someone, some descendant of Christopher Columbus. And, and there is no relative of Christopher, known relative of Christopher Columbus uh, buried in, in Italy, and there is no, no, no known descendant of the family of Christopher Columbus. There are many people with the, with the name uh, uh, Columbus in, in Italy, but, uh, but not that. So this is going to, I will explain you what we did, but th this is hard to prove that he's from Italy. Okay, so how do I summarize the question, uh, is Columbus Italian? If I, could, could you give me 30 seconds on how to summarize that? Okay, well, with the result that we have, we cannot say where he's from. It is much better to prove that he is linked to some other, to Portugal or to whatever. Sure, as opposed because to the, not yeah, being. As, yeah. yeah, as opposed to not being. It, it, it's always hard. I mean, uh, uh, if you don't have a, a direct reference sample to compare to, mm -hmm. it is very difficult. As it now stands, DNA science has not advanced far enough to prove Columbus's origin. But was he possibly fathered by the Duke of Beja, and therefore a member of Portuguese royalty? But proof positive would require the DNA of the Duke of Beja, or a first or second generation relative. Find the DNA of a 15th century Duke, or another member of the Portuguese royal family? Ordinarily, that would have been the end of the discussion but not for the knowledgeable and well-connected Evaristo. A well-placed phone call to a bishop, a quick explanation, and the explorers are given the keys to one of the most sacred sites in all of Spain, the crypt of Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand, the benefactors of Christopher Columbus. It is unheard of to be given such access to the crypt of Spain's most important king and queen. Even Lorente, who was born and lives in Granada, had never entered the royal crypt. Evaristo chooses to honor the moment with a single red rose. But the red rose is not for the queen, but another lesser known occupant of the crypt. And I'd like to present you Prince Miguel de la Paz. You had asked us to find a first or second generation would-be relative of Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. and he's right here in your hometown. I present Prince Miguel de la Paz. So, he was here. He was here all the time, and he's the son of King Manuel of Portugal and of Isabel and Ferdinand's daughter. That's, that's he, he died at the age of two. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can get DNA from him? Uh, we have to try. It's however it is possible. Well then, now it's all in your capable hands. Of course, there was one problem. Prince Miguel de la Paz is wrapped in an unbreachable lead coffin. Will the Spanish authorities allow them to open the coffin and collect the desired DNA? The next morning, the explorers travel to Seville to see the tomb of Columbus. It's a magnificent monument built in 1890. Inside the coffin, borne by the kings of Spain, are the remains of Christopher Columbus, or at least what remains of the remains. While Evaristo goes off to make a phone call, Horner and Perry find themselves sitting outside the cathedral, talking about the saga of Columbus's remains. Yeah, he died up north in Valladolid. He was there for a long period of time. Then his body was brought here to Seville. And then one of his relatives wanted his body in the Dominican Republic. So they brought his body over to the Dominican Republic. I believe it was in the 1700s. 
Then there was a revolution in the Dominican Republic and they decided to move him out, so he was brought to Cuba. Some of his remains were left in the DR. He's brought to Cuba. He's then moved back to Spain. Some of his remains are left in Cuba. And he's then laid to rest what's left of him here at, the, at this, in, in Seville. So his primary tomb is here in Seville, but in fact he's buried in at least four different places. So he's quite a traveler in death. Evaristo returns from his phone call with good news. The museum in Beja has agreed to let them examine the crypt where the Duke of Beja is buried. He was the member of royalty who, according to Portuguese tradition, may have fathered Columbus. But his DNA has never been examined. But if they can find some of his remains, Lorente says, he can compare them to those of Columbus and then it will truly be known who is buried in Columbus's tomb. Beja, Portugal was occupied for centuries by Romans, Visigoths, and Muslims. But it wasn't until King Sancho II took charge in the 13th century that it became a permanent fixture in Portugal's Alentejo region. In 1459, Prince Dom Fernando, aka the Duke of Beja, built this convent for an order of nuns. It has been many things since then, but in 1470, it was created to be the last resting place of the young Duke himself. The master of the Knights Templar and possible father of Christopher Columbus died at the age of 36. The former convent is now a museum that is home to some of the most important church art in Portugal. But our explorers are not here to admire the art. They are here to see who, if anyone, is buried in the sarcophagus of the Duke of Beja. If there is someone, they will compare his DNA to Christopher Columbus's and hope for a match. If a match happens, they will have changed the history books and ushered in a whole new era of historical research. Rather than pry up the lid of the monumental sarcophagus, Evaristo has chosen an easier way. Okay, what exactly are we going to do again? Well, what we're going to do is run this endoscopic camera into Prince Ferdinand, Duke of Beja's sarcophagus okay. to confirm if there are any human remains inside that we can extract DNA from. With the camera inside the sarcophagus, the explorers have a clear view of what is inside. The result? I'm not seeing anything in there. Like, actually, there's, this is an empty sarcophagus. Nada. There's nothing in there. The there's question nothing. is, what happened to the remains? Because there's no record of them having ever been removed. Let me, I'm gonna rewind this so you can take a look at it. See? Completely empty box. Empty. Yep. Completely empty. What happened to the Duke of Beja's remains? <laughs> I don't know. Before leaving the former convent, the three explorers pay their respects to Beatrice of Beja, wife of the Duke of Beja. An extraordinary lady, this Beatrice. Among her many accomplishments were two treaties that divided the uncharted world between Portugal and Spain. Over the grave of Beatrice, the explorers plan their next move. Horner can't help but wonder if she knew whether Columbus was her husband's illegitimate son. With the search for DNA on hold for the time being, the explorers decide to go back to the history books. They find them at Mafra Palace, in a town of the same name near Lisbon. Built in the 1700s for King John V, the massive palace contains a library of 36,000 leather-bound volumes. Some say it contains all of Western knowledge from the 14th to the 19th century. 
and some feel it was built from plans for a new Jerusalem, as found in the book of Revelations. The books are protected from paper-eating insects by tiny bats that patrol the library at night. Without them, the books would be reduced to book dust. It is here that our explorers come in search of information. Not from the books that surround them, but from a gadfly historian by the name of Manuel Gandra. Like Captain Barreto and other Portuguese Columbus theorists, Gandra feels that the life of Columbus portrayed in the history books has little to do with the truth. Mr. Fact, is Columbus Portuguese? Um, I think it was Portuguese uh, because everything uh, in his life um, tells us that uh, he knew Portuguese very well, he spoke Portuguese very well, he wrote Portuguese very well, better than he, he, didn't, he could not write or speak Italian, it seems. Okay, uh, but he, he could write very well Portuguese uh, as other languages, as for example Hebrew and and uh, Greek and Latin, uh, and um, there is a tradition um, about him he being Portuguese and son of uh, Grandmaster of the Order of Christ, Prince Ferdinand. Uh, yes, Prince Ferdinand. He was he was uh, he was. Uh, um, and, and a lady that uh, was um, from the family of the first of the first discoverers of of, of Madeira, uh, Zarco. Okay, and this tradition is very strong in here. And his signature, his cabalistic signature, shows that he was from that family. Salvador Zarco. Fernandez Zarco. Yeah, Salvador Fernandez Zarco. But there is another easier way to prove that Columbus was from Portugal. It doesn't involve the search for ancient DNA, nor does it require a long road trip. It only involves a map and a short drive to Cuba. Ah yes, Cuba, land of sand, sun, and skin. The island discovered by Christopher Columbus and named by him because because Cuba, Portugal was the town of his birth? That's what they say in Portugal. Here's the Duke of Braganza, for instance. The first main island he found, he named it Cuba. Then the islands around Cuba, some of them have names of villages in Alentejo around the, the little town of Cuba. And then there's the late historian, Captain Augusto Barreto. Well, um cardador de Genova que não sabia quem era a família que descobria, fazia aquelas navegações todas. Ele fez-lo porque era filho de um, de um nobre português, do Duque de, que também era navegador, o Duque de Beja. Not to forget Vasco da Gama, the 19th. E é interessante também que, à época, não existiria outra Cuba no mundo. Sim, tudo indica que, que ele, que lá chegou, que tenha dado à terra o nome da, da terra onde teria nascido, eventualmente. Mas isso são especulações, embora haja, haja escritores que, que já publicaram sobre isso. Mas eu estou firmemente convencido que ele, que ele era de origem portuguesa, só podia. E, e, e pode dizer que... À época não existiria outra Cuba senão a do Alentejo. Eu não conheço, no, olhando para o mapa mundo, não conheço mais nenhuma Cuba senão a Cuba do Alentejo e a Cuba que ele descobriu. Não, julgo que não existe Cuba em outro sítio qualquer, talvez no Vietnã do Norte, não sei, mas, mas eu desconheço a geografia dessas, dessas zonas. All of these experts and more insist not only that Christopher Columbus was born in Cuba, Portugal, but that he was the illegitimate son of a Portuguese prince. So off we go to Cuba, Portugal that is. There isn't much to see in Cuba. Here for instance is a church dating from the time of the Duke of Beja. It was on the grounds of this church where Columbus was believed to have been born to Isabel Sacara Zarco in a house that since has been torn down. 
his birth name, Salvador Fernandez Zarco, was later changed to Christopher Colon by the explorer himself. We'll get to that part of the story later. The Duke's plantation house next to the church is gone. A street named for Captain Barreto leads through the nearby village of Cuba to a tiny square and a statue of Columbus himself, gazing across the narrow street as though it were the great blue sea. Evaristo explains the statue, its meaning, and Cuba's astounding claim. Here in the center of the village square in Cuba, Alentejo, southern Portugal, is this monument honoring its most famous son, Christopher Columbus. The plaque here reads, historic truth. The first truth is that Columbus always hid his true origins and his true identity. That for 500 years, history has accepted an, an uncertainty, meaning that the story about him being from Genoa has never really been proven. Recently, however, notable historians and researchers have concluded that Christopher Colon was Portuguese. He was the son of the Infante Don Fernando, Prince Fernando, Duke of Beja, and of Lady Isabel Gonçalves Zarco. His real name was Salvador Fernandez Zarco, and he was born in the Alentejo here in Cuba. Columbus born in Cuba, Portugal? That's a bold claim for a nearly anonymous village. But the story goes one step further on the other side of the statue. On the other side of the monument to Columbus is this plaque. It reads, Alentejo, the motherland of the discoveries. It says that on the 28th of October, 1492, Christopher Columbus discovered an island that he named Cuba. There was no other Cuba in the world at the time except this Cuba here in Alentejo, Portugal. But the other sites that he also named in the New World in the places adjacent to Cuba have names from the same places that are adjacent to Cuba here in the Alentejo in southern Portugal. A look at a map of the Caribbean shows this claim to be true. Surrounding the Cuba of the Americas are more than 40 islands and locations with the same name as those adjacent to the Cuba of Portugal. This seems too astounding to be mere coincidence. Place names found on a map of Cuba, Portugal match those surrounding Cuba in the Caribbean? The explorers consider this to be geographic DNA, on par with human DNA, powerful evidence that Christopher Columbus was perhaps born in Cuba, Portugal. The mayor of Cuba, Joao Portugues, sits down with Evaristo in the village's modest Columbus Museum to back up that assertion. He begins with ancient history. Cuba, he says, dates from the Roman era. Portanto, é muito anterior ao Colombo, a designação de Cuba. Sim, sim. Portanto, estamos a falar de uns séculos antes da, da, da descoberta, das descobertas de Colombo. E, obviamente, essas próprias descobertas têm subjacentes o nome de Cuba, porque foram encontrados mais de 40 nomes atribuídos por Cristóvão Colombo junto portanto, da ilha, não é? sendo a maior ilha com o nome de Cuba. E, portanto, são lugares todos que, têm um, que estão situados num raio de 50 km à volta de, 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 da Viva de Cuba. E, portanto, isso para nós acaba de ser uma prova e uma evidência que Cristóvão Colombo, uh, portanto, quando deu esses nomes, não deu nomes italianos, não deu nomes espanhóis, mas deu nomes portugueses e de, de localidades que estavam próximas de Cuba. E que era natural de Cuba, certamente. Sim, portanto, a ideia é que nós temos é que ele era natural de Cuba. Aliás, existem provas quando ele se apresentou ao rei uh, de Espanha em Sevilha em 1505, o mando que ele tinha, portanto, era composto por três romãs, e essas três romãs são aquelas que fazem parte uh, do portal onde ele viveu aqui, na altura, uh, filho do Duque de Beja, uh, era, um, era um filho bastardo, mas que vivia aqui em Cuba, nesse portal. E é mesmo com esse, com esse mando que ele se apresenta, representando, uh, no fundo, aquilo que estava, que era o portal, que era onde ele tinha vivido toda a sua vida. This evidence is so convincing that Spain's state TV provided a series about Queen Isabel that portrayed Columbus as possibly having been a Portuguese secret agent. Mas, uh, repara, a, a televisão espanhola fez uma série, mas a, a televisão portuguesa ainda não fez. 
tinha de fazer, não é? devia fazer. Os próprios livros da história portugueses, se calhar, já deviam trazer qualquer coisa que também comprovasse esta teoria, mas não. Os próprios livros de história que hoje ainda são distribuídos não trazem esta teoria. E, portanto, é que eu digo, por isso é que falávamos aqui há pouco, que é preciso fazer mais. Uh, penso que não pode ser só o município de Cuba, não pode ser só a Associação Cristóvão Cova, não podem ser apenas uh, meia dúzia de historiadores que têm a boa vontade, uh, tem, tem que haver umas forças conjuntas que mostrem a verdade ao mundo. E penso que aqui o governo português poderia, através de outros meios, uh, reivindicar aquilo que é nosso, porque no fundo acaba por ser nosso. Nós sabemos a história dos navegadores portugueses, sabemos a importância que tivemos no mundo, mas se Cristóvão Colombo era de Cuba e era português, ainda poderíamos ter maior importância e maior história no mundo. A political cover-up? A desire to keep the truth about Columbus in the dark? That's what Evaristo thinks, and the mayor agrees. Mas parece ter havido, logo do início, um encobrimento da pessoa do Colombo. Quer dizer, ele morre, não há nenhum nome dele dado a nenhum, a nenhum local, e depois passa ao esquecimento e os próprios filhos têm que ir ao tribunal reivindicar direitos. Isto é um encobrimento político. Eu acho que toda a história do, do Cristóvão Colombo é um encobrimento, do, é um encobrimento desde o princípio, não é? Uhum. Tanto que ainda hoje nós não conseguimos destapar essa história. Hoje, ainda, ainda hoje ninguém consegue dizer onde, de onde é que é Cristóvão Colombo. Uh, não consegue ter provas concretas, não é? E é por isso que penso que tem-se trabalhado nos últimos anos, mas não se tem conseguido ainda chegar a um, uh, a um consenso. É óbvio que tem havido esse encobrimento que interessa a algumas pessoas. Uh, aos portugueses não interessa, aos cubenses também não interessa. Nós interessávamos conhecer a verdade, porque temos a certeza que a verdade é aquela que nós defendemos. It's a conspiracy of fear, says Evaristo. Fear of stepping out from the academic crowd and changing history. But change is never easy. In fact, the only thing harder, says Evaristo, is the search for truth that brings you against long-held beliefs. The mayor agrees. Sim, não é, nunca é fácil mudar uma história. Não é fácil mudar a história, não é? Uh, a própria história prova-nos que, se calhar, a própria história tem muitas mentiras, tem muitas inverdades ao longo dos anos. E a história foi sempre contada assim. E, de repente, mudava, não é fácil. Uh, se não é fácil mudar o cotidiano e a vida das pessoas, quanto mais mudar a história. E, portanto, uh, por isso é que muitos historiadores, a princípio, uh, até porque, se calhar, não eram eles que a defendiam, não defendiam essa tese, portanto, acharam no talvez, absurda, acharam que seria que seria impossível ser assim, não é? Uh, nos últimos anos temos tem se conseguido alguns apoios, como foi dito aqui da, da Real Academia de História Portuguesa, que também tem sido importante nos últimos anos uh, nesta neste apoio que tem dado ao município e à Associação Cristóvão Colón, uh, mas é verdade que tem havido nos últimos anos um apoio diferente daquilo que houve no, numa numa primeira fase. Uh, e, portanto, esperemos que, que, que aquilo que estamos a fazer aqui hoje possa também dar um impulso que seja importante no futuro para repor a, a verdade histórica. So, does the theory that Columbus was born in Portugal stand up to critical thought? Professor Gondra thinks that same question should be asked of Genoa. Does their belief that Columbus was born in Italy stand up to critical thought? So, myth or fact, was Columbus then born in Cuba? In Alentejo, it seems, it seems, uh, it seems that uh, all the, the islands and all the places he, he, he he discovered in New World, took the names of places around the place where he was born. Forty of them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and Cuba was one of the main uh, places, as we know. Uh, so, it's, uh, it's curious, because if he was from Genova, <laughs> that was not explained. It was, there was no, no way to explain that. Yes, difficult to explain indeed. Still, the question remains. If not Italian, as the textbooks say, then who was Christopher Columbus? There are those who say that the secrets of Columbus are contained in his signature, a complex collection of letters and symbols that reveal the identity of the great explorer and perhaps including two of the most tantalizing secrets of all, that he had been of Jewish heritage and that he was a Portuguese secret agent a 007 for the King of Portugal, with a license to kill. This is the signature of Christopher Columbus. Technically, it is referred to as a cipher, 
a way of including secret information in the course of signing one's name. Captain Barreto researched this triangular signature of dots and letters for more than a decade, and Evaristo is certain he deciphered the mystery. Another one of the mysteries of Columbus is, of course, his name, his cipher, and uh, his coat of arms. We know that there are many controversies and many theories out there um, for what this actually means. Some people say uh, it's, it, it's a reference to Kabbalah. Others say it's a reference to Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, the interpretation by Captain Barreto is that uh, it reveals that this man is Salvador because today, uh, when we buy a, a sports car or something that's uh, very valuable or very important, we in Portuguese say XPTO, means it's great. So what we have here is X, a P, a T, and an O. It actually means Salvador. It means Christ, the Savior, the supreme uh, person that the Templar Knights paid homage to. So. The captain says that this means Salvador. Next, we have Ferenz. Ferenz means, of course, uh, Ferdinand, for Fernandez, which is son of Ferdinand. And then you have a Z, because the Zs were actually made like this, but in, in, in reverse, and that would mean Zarco. So Salvador Fernandez Zarco. Then you have what's called a column, or a, a, a colon in, in English. Uh, in, in Portuguese, it's a colon. And if you, if you, it actually means colon, colon. So if we take this word here, it means Christopher, 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 with the T and the P, Christopher, colon, Christopher Colon. If we continue and we do this, then we have Christopher Colomb, Fernandes. We already, we already know it's Salvador. And if we take a mirror and put it here, the S becomes a Z. And that indicates Zarco. So if you look at this cipher and take it apart like Captain Barreto did, you have the S, the F, and the Z. Salvador Fernandez Zarco. One of the conclusions reached is the notion that the supposed mother of Columbus, Isabel Zarco, was the daughter of Jewish-Italian explorer Joao Gonsalves Zarco, and thus giving the explorer Jewish ascendancy. Other historical researchers have come to the same or similar conclusions. British historian Cecil Roth felt the cipher was a substitute for Kadesh, a Jewish prayer recited by mourners after the death of a relative. And indeed, the sons of Columbus did say Kadesh for their father when he died. And there was Simon Wiesenthal, the noted Nazi hunter, whose book, Sails of Hope, built the case that Columbus's voyage was motivated by a desire to find safe haven for the 800,000 Jews subject to expulsion from Spain during the Inquisition. To show solidarity with the Jews of Spain, Jewish scholars say that he set sail for the New World on August 6, 1492, the very day the Jews were given the choice of converting to Catholicism, leaving Spain, or being killed. So what was the atmosphere like here when, when uh, Columbus and his crew left? Was it, was it festive? Were they excited about this search for the New World? Well, the day that they left, it was calm. But the days leading up to his departure were total chaos because the queen had ordered all the Jews to leave Spain and leave all their property behind. And the docks were just uh, full of Jews trying to board ships. So it was total chaos. Wow. Does that likely confirm Columbus himself was a Jew? Well, yes and no. So was Columbus hiding his Jewish heritage? Or is that a myth of history, a misreading of Columbus's true faith? The researchers from Raha want to find out. 
Evaristo stops the carriage and escorts Horner into the Mother of God convent, formerly a Jewish synagogue built in the time of Columbus. So this used to be a synagogue up until 1492 when the Jews were driven out of Spain. In 1495, they turned it into a Christian building. They turned it into a church and a convent. And this convent, out of all the convents in the city, was especially favored by the Christopher Columbus family. And it was actually the pantheon, it says there, the pantheon of uh, Christopher Columbus's family and where his granddaughters are buried. Fantastic. So why would they choose a former synagogue as their final resting place and their family mausoleum, their family pantheon? It's very, very strange. And then it's into the synagogue turned church where Evaristo shows Horner the tombs of the Columbus granddaughters. This is the tomb of four of Christopher Columbus's granddaughters here in Sevilla at the convent of the Mother of God. They endowed this convent with funds so that they could be buried here and have their family plot. This used to be a Jewish synagogue. Evaristo also shows Horner the ornate altar that separates the tombs of Hernan Cortez's widow and daughter, and then reveals a startling fact. You know that in 1495, when they turned this into a convent, they gave it to the female branch of the Dominican order. And that's the same order that Isabella commissioned to start the Inquisition. A few weeks after his visit to the Jewish ghetto in Seville, Evaristo finds himself at a cemetery in Madrid with Vatican lawyer Luis Castro. Evaristo has found research that links Columbus's triangular signature of dots and letters with a cryptic inscription resembling three balls in a triangular shape. This shape is said to be found in Jewish cemeteries. They decide to do some research. Well, this is clearly a Jewish tombstone. It has the Star of David. And here again, we have the repetitive three, 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 and three. You have the three balls, three yeah, balls, yeah. three balls, which are depicted as seeds because they're blossoming. Yeah, into the branches that are again doubled, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Yeah. Further into the cemetery, they find what they are looking for. And the three balls depicted like that yes. are not seeds, obviously. They may be the symbol of money changers, or money lenders, bankers, uh -huh. uh, as was used back in the Middle Ages with the uh, the Jewish community and also with the Templars who were bankers. Yeah, I think so. And they're still used today by many uh, credit establishments all over the world. There are other pieces of evidence that seem significant to the question of Columbus's faith. In his will, he left money to a Jew who lived at the entrance to the Jewish quarter in Lisbon. He tithed a tenth of his income to the poor, a Jewish custom. And when he returned to Spain after his discovery of the New World, his first two letters were not to Isabel and Ferdinand, but to Luis de Santangel and Gabriel Sanchez, the prominent Jews who had helped fund his voyage. Is this evidence another sign of Columbus's Jewish heritage? Very possibly, say many researchers. But the Duke of Braganza has another theory. He believes that Christopher Columbus was a devout Catholic but straddled both Christianity and Judaism through the heritage of his Catholic father and Jewish mother. Listen carefully as His Highness explains the dual faith of Christopher Columbus. His name means uh, uh, dove, Columbus. And, uh, and Christophorus, it means Christ. So it's the dove of Christ. It's a symbolic name for the the empire of the Holy Spirit, because the idea of the Portuguese was that our discoveries were not to build a political empire, but to build the empire of the Holy Spirit that was called at the time the Fifth Empire. And it was the idea that the whole world should be united under the Holy Spirit, and it would be a time of peaceful, brotherhood between every country and every people and the rulers 
would rule following the, the laws of God. And then his official name could be a symbol to explain that he was preparing the world for this uh, empire of the Holy Spirit. So what you're saying then is that his real name was not Christopher Columbus? No, no, I'm quite sure it was not. It was an official name he built for himself. He should be probably Zarko, his first name, his family name, because it was the name of uh, his, her, his mother. Let's talk about his mother for a minute. Uh, there, there's a belief that he was, he was Jewish on, the, on his maternal side. True or false? It's possible that his mother had a Jewish ascendancy, even if, because the, the reason why he never spoke about her mother could be this one, I don't know. But it's, it's a mystery. But it could be, it's, because he had many connections with Jewish culture. He was interested in, in the Jewish uh, tradition. So it could, probably could be the, the son of a Jewish mother. Maybe the Zarko family was uh, Jewish. Columbus's mother may be Jewish, agrees Gondra. But in the end, if he is the son of a Portuguese prince, he is of royal blood. Even uh, if uh, the family, Zarko family, was Jewish, and uh, uh, Colin's mother was Jewish, his father was not. And that prevailed? I think so. I think so because he was very, very, uh, uh, he was received as a, uh, and he, 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 he told us, he wrote that he was uh, from royal family, and he was not the first admiral of his family, and his father was an admiral. So uh, cloth tanners from Genoa were not admirals. No, uh, this is a we know we know that that's a, a good a good uh, theory, but not not a true one. So why uh, the cover up? Um, it's not a cover up. It's something someone invented, because uh, nor Colin nor his son Ferdinand, for example, tell us about. Uh, Colin being, being Genovese, okay? Um, he, te he tells us uh, different things about uh, his father and his uh, ancestry. That's not from Italy or from Genova. Everything Colin wrote about himself and his family comes to the same point, and this is royal family, Portuguese royal family. Which brings us back to the Duke of Braganza, a confirmed descendant of King John II and the Duke of Beja and unconfirmed descendant of Christopher Columbus himself. If he was supposed to spy, it was not very clever to everybody know that he is the son of a Portuguese prince. The Spanish would not believe him. Before Columbus's fourth voyage, he was arrested. And he was arrested for uh, treating the, the uh, Indians poorly in the New World. But you don't feel like that was why he was arrested. You feel like it was another reason. I believe that this was an excuse to arrest him. The main reason was that they discovered he was a Portuguese spy. Perhaps there is more proof that Columbus was a secret agent in the Treaty of Tordesillas. The 1494 treaty divided the world between Spain and Portugal. The purpose of the treaty was to settle conflicts over the land discovered by Columbus. But before the treaty was ratified, King John II insisted that Portugal get a much larger slice of the world than originally agreed to. The king wanted the dividing line to be moved west, which would give Portugal domain in two countries only they knew existed, Brazil and Canada. That is why Evaristo will examine an official copy of the great treaty that divided the world. Evaristo is convinced by references to Columbus in the treaty that he helped King John II in his demand to move the dividing line 180 leagues to the west, giving domain to Portugal in Brazil and Canada. Such help on the part of Columbus would amount to a true act of espionage. 
in the, the, in the description of the motives, the reasons why uh, they're dividing up the world, um, there is direct reference to Columbus. So this is a pontifically um, overseen document, a treaty between two kingdoms, two nations, rectified by the Pope himself with direct mention of Christopher Columbus. Evaristo carefully explores the yellowed pages. And uh, Columbus is, is actually referenced because they use his discovery as the basis of uh, the place where they drew the line between uh, Portugal and Spain. Evaristo digs deeper into the document for more information. Now, you can see in the document the references to Portugal and to its discoveries and also to Castile. And if you look here, you see referenced King John's name, Don Juan. The boundary line was changed hundreds of miles west after King John II demanded it be moved. The move gave Portugal much of Brazil, the existence of which had been a closely held secret known only to Portugal's great navigators. Columbus surely helped convince his relative, King John II, to push for the westward expansion, says Evaristo. By moving the line some 370 leagues from what was originally proposed, John II and the Templars of Portugal actually laid claim to Brazil. So the question is, did they know of Brazil's existence before the treaty and before Columbus discovered America? We believe they did. The three Raja explorers ponder the changes in the treaty and their potential value, but to Dave Horner, there is no mystery. The value in moving the boundary to the west is as clear as the map in Columbus's hands. The treaty of Tordesillas executed is what might come out of that in the future. And if you put these two countries together, and this would fit, tuck up under this cape here, here they're finding, you know, the first big thing they found was the gold mine at Mino. Exactly. And so not only were they getting that out of Africa, just exactly opposite on this side of the line of demarcation where it was appearing gold and silver in uh, Brazil. In Brazil, exactly. So it all at one time perhaps was a continent that broke apart and, uh, and so you can see today the, the, the tremendous amount of raw material in valuable uh, jewels and metals that came out of not only here, but also the African coastline in the central part of Africa. So that was probably why Portugal wanted the line moved from what was suggested by Castile so that they could have the 370 leagues and in this way keep Brazil, which they had already discovered. They really discovered. hadn't found that much gold and silver in the New World just from the early discoveries, but King John wanted as much as he could get of anything. And so he was successful in moving that line, and his move caused uh, pretty good luck for the people who were backing him. So in that sense, if Columbus was a secret agent, his mission was successful. His mission was tremendously successful when you look at the vast quantities of gold, silver, and all the related uh, the metals and, and, and similar benefits that are coming out of this, not only this section of South America, but also the West Coast, too. In the end, says Professor Gondra, these and other actions of Columbus make him one of history's most infamous 007s, maybe. Well, let me just ask you a question point blank. Myth or fact, was Columbus a secret agent for King John II? It's fact. Um, we must understand two things, uh, very important. Secret was only, uh, was always um, the great uh, goal of this uh, enterprise, discoveries, since Henry Navigator. But 
with John II, this was even bigger. This secrecy was even bigger because there was, the, there were the Spanish uh, looking for the same things that we were, we Portuguese were. So John II had to had to prevent the Spanish to get there first, and it was why uh, he tried with Colomb to um, to uh, divert. to divert them to other places, not to the South Atlantic, the South Ant Atlantic, but to the Antilles, to uh, be lost there and not to follow Portuguese to the South. Occupy their time. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And Colon was uh, one of the main uh, subjects to or main of those agent, agents, Portuguese agents that. Uh, uh, did uh, the, that uh, uh, tried to do that? So he did 007. Yeah, uh, perhaps <laughs> at that time. If Columbus was indeed a secret agent, then this is the smoking gun a safe conduct letter issued by King John II of Portugal in the same year that he arrived in Spain for the first time. The document identifies Columbus as the most esteemed friend and agent of King John II. It's both a get-out-of-jail card and a license to kill that only a 007 agent would have. It was Columbus's own son who referred to this document for the first time in the biography of the admiral that he wrote. The document was rumored to have been lost and nobody had seen it for over 500 years. But we rediscovered it in the archive of the Indies in Seville, in the reserved section. The Raja team returns to its headquarters in Orem Castle to talk about the research. The three are thrilled with their findings. I'm particularly impressed with the, particularly the youngest of the Columbus sons, who was begging and crying at, um, at the deathbed of his father. Please, father, tell us who our father really was. We must know. We're entitled to know that father. Those are the very words. And they also wanted to know what so many other people want to know. Was he a secret agent for King John II? Was he Portuguese? Absolutely. And his own son uh, raised these questions and initiated the investigation over 500 years ago. He went three times to Genoa and found no evidence that he was from Genoa and then declared that the only thing that he knew about his father was that at a certain point in his life, he went back to using the alias of Christopher Columbus. But it wasn't just and only his son. The entire Columbus family was so convinced of their father's telling the truth that they carried out a lawsuit against the government of Spain for two and a half centuries. Now that tells you something and you want to believe at least. I want to know who paid that legal bill. Was Christopher Columbus truly Italian, or was he the illegitimate son of a Portuguese prince? Was Columbus Jewish? Was he a secret agent for King John II of Portugal? The modern day explorers feel they had almost assuredly answered those questions. Yet there is only one thing that keeps them from declaring total victory, the DNA. The only source of DNA that could link Columbus directly to his supposed father would be the DNA of the Portuguese royal family. And the best source available would be Prince Miguel de la Paz, believed to be a nephew of Columbus. Yet no matter how hard the Raja team tried, the keepers of the crypt at Granada Cathedral would not let them open the young prince's coffin. His eternal slumber was not to be interrupted for the time being. But maybe the answers they were looking for already existed. As the researchers were about to leave their interview with the Duke of Braganza, they stopped at paintings showing his royal ancestors. It was there that the Duke told them something they had not yet heard. A sample of DNA had been taken from him for testing in Dr. Laurente's lab. The results, although not conclusive, he said, 
appear to have a DNA link between him and the subject of the film, Christopher Columbus. They convinced him to share those results on camera. Well, recently there have been new discoveries that are very interesting and that I would really advise you to look at. I'm not a professional historian, and, um, but I, I think it's a fascinating thing. I did some DNA tests. Yeah, so can you tell me, yeah, tell me about that? Well, I don't know exactly the results because it seems it was difficult to, to establish the DNA of uh, Christopher Columbus, Christopher Colombo, but it seems there is some DNA connection between me and him. Which is why the researchers from Raha cannot declare the end of this subject. Until final DNA studies are able to be carried out, the case of Christopher Columbus has no ending. A partial mystery that remains to be continued. in this room that Columbus met the emissary of Queen Isabella, finally giving permission for him to set sail to discover the new world. It's hard to believe that he was seated at this table, probably in this chair, with Fray Antonio de Marcena, who was the friar here, who was an astrologist, and they discussed the final plans for the discovery of the new world. There's no question that after several weeks at sea, people became edgy, some more than others. But after another couple of weeks, then things began to rip, and anything could set off, you know, small torch could set off a big fire very quickly as far as negative thinking, conversation that wasn't motivational, and so forth. So where do you think Columbus actually lived for seven years in this monastery? You are standing on it. He lived right here. Right here? In a couple of these porticos, actually. And this painting depicts that right here. Here is Columbus with a couple of the Franciscan monks. They're standing in the uh, porticos, looking out to sea, talking to each other. And over here is a jar full of leeches, which is what medicine consisted of in those days.